Welcome to the Big Fat Real Estate Checks Podcast with Marco Kozlowski, where we help investors like you get the knowledge and skills you need to replace your J-O-B with passive cash flow for life. Welcome back to yet another fabulous episode with us to confuse you <laughs> on how to... Uh, do what comes next. Uh, what are we going to talk about today, boys? Due I diligence. See, the D. See, D. D. Some double, the double D's. D's. Double D's. Oh, yeah. Uh, don't get your mind in the gutter. Oh, no. We're talking about due diligence, yes. ladies and germs, uh, and what to do before closing on a property. And we're going to discuss residential, which is a single family, a duplex, triplex, or a quad. And what are the things that you should be looking for? What are the things that you should be doing? and uh, sort of the traps that might be set for you most of the time unintentionally uh, and what you should uh, do and look for and be careful of before buying a property. Now, um, this could actually be a 100 hour saga yes. of all the things that could go, uh, could go sideways. We're not going to do that. We're not going to talk no, about We're going to go over brush strokes and- um, So let's go we sequentially too. D- deep dive. Yeah. yeah. So let's start with single family. Single family, well, single family, duplex, triplex, I think that part is saying, what I mean is that we should start with, what do we do first? Always the income. We want to make sure that the income pans out yep. before we get to uh, the next step, which will be uh, the condition of the property. So Let's from an income perspective, yeah, the income perspective. We'll ask the accountant. <laughs> That's right. Tell us more. Where is he? <laughs> Tell us more. But wait, there's more there's about more. numbers. All right. So obviously if, uh, so single family, there might not be tenants, right? It might be an owner that's actually just selling their home and you want to put a tenant in there. So if you want to do that, there's no lease, obviously, nobody's living there. So what you want to do is check if, uh, or what kind of rent you can get for that property so you can validate uh, what type of gross income, we've covered gross income in the past, uh, you can get. So how do we do that? You tell me, how do we do that? Tell the folks how do they find what the rent is, the market rent is for that. Well, the market rent, you need, so once you have the address, you're going to go into uh, rental meter. Is there any other location that you guys know of? But that's the one I like to use. www.rentometer.com. Yes. R-E-N-T-O meter.com. And so you punch in the address, you punch in the number of bedrooms, bathrooms you have, and you press search. And then it'll give you uh, the surrounding uh, comparable rents that there are in your area or the area of that home. And based on that, you can come up with uh, an approximate uh, gross income that you can make with that property. So if you were to rent the home, it would be, what do we take? Take the midpoint? We, we like to let work actually with the lowest yep. amount just to make sure that you can make ends meet. You want to be conservative, but another uh, site, so rent meter is, is a great thing. But mm-hmm. what I found actually too is when you type in uh, the address and go to Zillow, uh, Zillow also advertises for rent properties. Uh, it's not just for sale properties. Okay. So they'll indicate... And actually, I've, if I'm not mistaken, there's a for sale tab and a rent tab on Zillow website. So if you go to Zillow, so googlezillow.com, and go in there and click the <laughs> click the for lease or for rent. It's one of those two words. They're interchangeable, but that's okay. And th- these would be what uh, owners are asking as rent, right? Not what they were rented for. That's correct. Okay. So you'll see what uh, you'll see what others in that area and zip. So you just put the zip code, and you'll see what others are renting there. Because you, ultimately, you're going to be competing with those people, whether they're in a, a half a mile radius or, or a mile radius. So that would be a good, uh, I guess, picture of what that competitive market in that area will go for. So I would probably use both. Yeah. Just anal that way. Just at the end of the day, the, you got to come up with a conservative value for what you can rent it for. Then multiply that monthly amount by 12 and you'll have your yearly gross income. After that, what you want to do, the only other thing to do is to check all the expenses. So what are the, the utility bills that go that go with that property? You can get this usually from the seller. Uh, the tax, the taxes, you can get that publicly, get that on Zillow. You can get that from the county itself. Uh, it's, I mean, you can get the copies from the sellers, but anything you can actually validate through a third party or an unbiased third party, you should do that. Uh, so, so, got, so the property tax, going back on the yeah. property tax, you can actually just go I, I know, on, I don't, I don't think yeah, Zillow. 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 Yeah, you can put property tax information and it there. takes you right to the county website and okay. it'll tell you right away. Either that or just Google the, the county and then yeah. tax collector and you should come. Either way, you got to validate it through a third party. So so taxes, insurance, I mean, you can take the quote from the, the owner, but yeah, your best bet is to just call a couple of insurers or a broker and have them quote you on the, on the property and that'll give you a good idea of what you're going to be paying because... 
what you're going to be paying and what someone else who's been there for 30 years is paying may not be the same, especially if they haven't had any claims. Actually, I would ask for, for the insurance. What I normally do is just ask the owner as part of my due diligence is just asking for a copy of their current insurance yeah, policy. But you have to compare it to what I, I got to compare it, but I want to see their policy because their policy may be different. They may have a, a gajillion dollar deductible. And if they're paying like, you know, 5,000 deductible versus a 1,000 deductible, your premiums are going to be totally different. Agreed. So I would like to compare it on that and, and basically on the dwelling. What are they covering the dwelling for, right? Uh, and typically on the insurance companies, they do uh, a desk appraisal. Uh, for those properties and they'll have the value because they'll have the replacement value on that insurance document on that policy mm -hmm. so that will give you just another indication are you buying it right and we discussed this on a different episode right. uh but that at the end i just wanted to throw that in didn't mean to and I'll, also also yeah yeah and uh also to have a make sure that you can have a, a renter in there as well if it's owner occupied it changes the dynamic as well on the insurance policy if you have a tenant in there yep, and you need the liability insurance uh, yeah. as well so there are going to be some um, varying factors if it was owner occupied versus um, tenants on, on that are going well. to be uh, occupying yeah. the property but insurance isn't that expensive That's it's right. not something no. that uh, and it has to be done um, taxes have to be paid um, and then, taxes insurance and then you always there's the maintenance factor which uh, is going to always be we, we take 10 percent as a as a flat sort of uh, provision of gross so, so of gross income so yeah. yeah so let's let's again maybe let's put a, a number on the rent two thousand dollars a month on the two thousand dollars a month on the rent so two by twelve is twenty four thousand so ten percent of that will be twenty four hundred dollars yeah. so twenty four hundred dollars for maintenance uh, for the year is what you should have as a provision you can put that in your in your calculation to come to your net income uh, then there's management management is also typically about ten percent so add another twenty four hundred dollars to this example so now you've covered the taxes, insurance, maintenance, management, all the other shit, you can put another provision of that, you can throw in another 5%, and uh, you pretty much can calculate your net income on that. So now if that number is positive, uh, then you're, <laughs> that's a good start. And then you gotta factor in obviously your, uh, your, uh, your financing. What, what do you mean that. if that number is positive? As in that uh, once you remove all these expenses, the TIMS from your gross income of, uh, what do we say it was, $24,000, whatever is left is your net operating income. This is how much your property is going to generate before you pay your mortgage. Correct. So let's say that number at $24,000 uh, turns into $12,000. Yep. Let's call it twelve. And uh, they're asking $500,000 for the property. All right. Yeah. So now we, we, we got to also look at it from a cap perspective. So if they're asking 5,000, you got 500,000. 500,000, and yeah. you're making only $12,000. So if they were asking $100,000, that would be 12%. So now you're gonna have to divide that by five. That's uh, a shitload less. That's 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 a I shitty return. I didn't get that. What do you mean divide it by five? Well, because you said $500,000. So if it's a $500,000 and you're only making 12 a year, right? Are you making any money or are you losing money? That's the question I have. So oh. if they're asking 500000 and your income is only 12000 are you going to make money at this thing? That's the question. Well, you're not going to make it. Well, you're making 12000 in that year, every year. Now, it depends on how you pay for the 500000 So if I have a five, if I get, let's say that the property is worth a million and I were to buy this for, because it's a single family. Yes. And I, I, I get a loan for 500000 So you think, no, wow, right. I got this great deal. But the most you can rent it out for is $2,000 a month yeah. and you keep 12000 how are you going to support that five hundred thousand dollars? You can't. You're going to have to support it out of your own pocket. Well, let's let's prove that. So, what's five hundred thousand at ten percent interest? If you were going to get a ten percent loan, fifty grand. That's yeah. fifty grand. So, can you afford to pay a fifty thousand dollar mortgage with yeah, twelve thousand dollars in in, in 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 rental income? You can't. No. So, renting that property isn't going to be the solution. It would be to flip it. If you're buying a million dollar property for five hundred thousand. And you can't rent it, then sell it for seven hundred and make two hundred thousand. Someone who wants to live in there. That's correct. So you sell it yeah. to an owner occupied, uh, right. and and that's how you would determine uh, if you're gonna how you're gonna make money at this. So understand that if you, we're always looking at how can we how how can we lose, and what can we do to fix it. And the first thing we're gonna look at is can we rent this sucker. Yes. And if the answer is no, then we have to think, okay, well, is there equity in the property? If there is, how can we profit from that equity? Okay. And in this case, it would be either flipping it or wholesaling it or uh, wholetailing it or uh, doing owner financing on it. There's, that's a whole other series of episodes. But today, it's... It's due diligence. So presumably, you have a contract based on numbers. So if you're under contract, it means that the numbers, at least before you check them, made sense, right? So all you want to do now is validate that what you were told before 
is accurate. So now let's get into the duplex, triplex, because they typically have tenants in there. And the only difference is that you're going to want to check the leases, if there are existing leases or not, because sometimes uh, there aren't leases at all, even though the people are actually paying. So you got to validate the income. If you can validate the income, we've, we've, we've learned how to validate the, validate the expenses. Validating the income in this case would be one, check the leases. Two is ask for either bank statements because it's all nice and dandy to have leases, but I think we can all draw up leases for each other if we need some. Yep. So you got to make sure that the money is actually collected and that the tenants are paying. So there's only two real ways of doing that. Either one, you can check in the bank statements that there are deposits equal to the lease amounts. Just want to uh, chime in here that sometimes in a smaller pro in smaller properties, um, they haven't separated their uh, their yeah. property from their personal uh, bank, bank statements, statements, and there will be some blowback uh, in many cases where if you ask for bank statements. Uh, they're going to be like, what the hell is going on? Correct. I've actually had someone call the FBI and get a call from the <laughs> FBI thing, you know, what kind of scam are you guys running? I'm like, I'm trying to buy a property. I want to validate the income of the property. And usually you put the money in the bank because it's very hard to falsify bank statements. So uh, understand that if you are asking for bank statements to uh, ask to redact the, uh, the account numbers, we don't want to know the account number. So any personal information, uh, we're going to get to taxes as well, the yeah. tax returns. Tax returns. Um, we want to redact our social security numbers and whatever numbers that we don't need to have. So that's, that's another way around that, actually, with the bank state. They don't the have deposit to. slips. Is yes. that the yeah. deposit slips? That's where I was stacked. going. That was the yeah. second way. So, sorry. yeah. I'm sorry. So, so when you go to the bank and make a deposit, you usually get a deposit slip or sort of a receipt of the deposit. So even if you were to see that, then that's usually enough. Uh, now, can they reproduce these or can they create these? Yes, but they would have to go to uh, That's a hard like the extent of, of what they need to do to get that done is, is is probably not worth it for them. So you can you can use that as validation. Uh, another way is tax returns. Are they declaring the income that they're actually making in their tax returns? And that's usually a separate line from their actual employment income. Again, you can have them redact you know, the social security numbers and all the personal information, uh, as long as you know that it's theirs in their name or in their entity name, if they have this under a, an LLC or another type of corporation, and, so, on and you some can of validate these, it. Yeah, on some of these smaller properties, they're mom and pops. And, yeah. and, and mom and pops don't have the properties and, and, and separate legal entities. So uh, asking for tax returns, again, it, it's on their individual tax returns. Yeah. But some of them, you know, even if it is a mom and pop and they don't have a legal entity, on their tax returns, there's, there's a specific schedule that they use. You can just ask for the schedule, and that schedule is to determine schedule their... One. Uh, schedule E. Uh, e, I one. believe it is. I, I don't know, I'm not a CPA here, but it's, it's one schedule where they can calculate the depreciation on, on the property. So you don't see their the rest of their whole ten, uh, 1040s. You see that one schedule yeah. where it outlines the property, and you can see um, uh, the deductions and whatever. Yes. So you, you can even see their income for that portion. Uh, without asking for the whole And in Schedule 1, you'll have all the expenses that they're actually claiming against that income to yes. reduce their income. So uh, so th those are certain ways you can do that. And you're going to get some pushback. You're going to get some blowback on this. And, and all this, like what you want to do is reduce your risk, right? So if they're not providing you with any of this, then that's going to be an opportunity for you to, you know, tell them that this increases your risk because you don't know if there's collection and you can reduce the reduce the price. You can do a million things. Actually, there's seven there's seven things you can do when we can't validate income. Yeah. Um, we're not going to go through all seven of them, no. but there there's different ways that we can um, go around that or renegotiate the purchase price. Uh, the purchase price mm -hmm. um, offering you know rent guarantees. Wholesaling uh, it. Th there's, there's again the seven there's ways so we're not going to go through that. Yeah. So once you verify the income and expenses, what should be their next step? So if you're comfortable with the, the the income and expenses and that you are able to validate that your purchase price is is the accurate one given the the income and expenses, then the second step would be well, if we're doing uh, one to four units, the the income wouldn't affect the purchase price. That's just if we do get a mortgage, can we support it? That's right. Uh, well, the value presumably you've checked that uh, before getting on the contract. So you, should we should check it again, or shouldn't we? Why not? Yeah, you know, I think we should, right? What's it actually worth? Getting a couple uh, BPOs, which are broker price opinions. Uh, you could get CMAs, which are current mar market analyses from different agents, um, and really figuring out uh, the best you can uh, what this thing is worth. 
uh, seeing what uh, the properties that have sold are not the properties that are listed this is a big trap as well yes um, the asking the, prices is where you're looking at everything that's on the market and if nothing is selling it's not worth that I've seen that multiple times where there's a ton of inventory and nothing is selling it's not worth that then if nothing yeah. is selling it's it's what the sold properties are yeah. that, that matter Actually, you can even uh, contact the realtor that's actually selling the house. I know you don't go by based on what they're selling, but you can say, I'm interested in it. So if you're if you're looking at a, a three-unit or, or a quad or four-unit, you would phone a realtor in that area and say, listen, I'm looking for a three-unit or a four-unit in this zip code. Can you help me out? They'll send you one of their listings or a listing, and usually on that uh, on that listing, there's comps that have already been sold that's right. that are comparable, so you can use those to help you determine the value of the property that you're using. So make sure so, the value yeah. is there. Well, the make value sure. should be first then, if, if you're gonna double check that, and then once you double check that the value is right, meaning that your purchase price is correct, then you gotta make sure that even if you buy it, that you're making money with it. Correct. So now mm -hmm. that you've checked that you've made money with it, the third step is checking the condition. And to do that, uh, there's it's it's you can do a, a couple of things. Obviously there's the inspector, right? Send in an inspector. Uh, a property inspector they'll check foundation all the structure they'll check the roof you want plumbing to be checked and you want electrical to it's, be checked because if the property has plumbing issues it's going to cost a shit electrical ton. if it has electrical issues it's going to cost if it has foundation issues it could cost um you know roof issues uh these are the major um, yeah. issues that you want to take a look foundation at foundation are the scariest and, ones and uh they're, they could all be scary. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I we bought a property where you know the tenants poured concrete down down the sinks. You know, because wow. they were pissed off at the and the toilets. So, could you imagine that? So yeah. it's you know, tenants do crazy things, and we want to know what these issues are before getting into them, so we can really figure these things out. And uh, the inspection report will now uh, will, will will tell you um, what the what the items are of concern are and the, the inspector's job is to find as many problems as possible. So they're wagging their tail and they're very happy uh, to be able to, to get that done. And they're not expensive, like 500 bucks uh, for an inspection. Yeah, yeah for that's uh, and, property. And, and you can get that money back at closing. So that is something that you're going to want to, uh, it's actually the best investment ever because if it looks great, it smells great, but the the, the, the mechanicals are, are shitty, meaning that you know things are going to break down very quickly, uh, and the electrical is bad, and the plumbing is bad, and there's all these issues with the property. Not buying that property it was the best $500 you could ever spend. 100%. Because that is just fabulous. Take that $500 receipt and save it for the next one because you can actually get paid back on the next deal. Uh, and use that receipt so you can get reimbursed on the next property that you buy so you get that money back as well. So you, it's money that's uh, invested, so invested yeah. uh, but not lost because you yeah. can always get that back. And we don't recommend doing your own inspection because oh, you don't know. I, and I, I know we... We, when, we don't even I, have to go see it yourself. Well, when I, when I first started doing single families and I sent the inspector out, there, there's shit that you don't know unless you're in that profession, but there's shit that comes up like the panel, the lights work and everything, but there was one particular panel uh, in this particular house, that it was it, it was a voodoo. It was a it was a panel that was produced back in the '90s, and no not insurance cold. company will touch it. Yeah. No, they had fire issues. They because uh, it's not a knob and tube, but knob and tube is another thing. I wouldn't even know to even recognize what a knob and tube uh, electrical knob, is, and, then, and, and a tube, tube that goes yeah. in there. But either way, this panel, if it, with this panel in this particular house, the insurance will not even insure you unless you remove that panel and and, and redo. Uh, the electrical, so you wouldn't know, or the Chinese drywall, mm. you won't know that unless you're educated. So or spending, asbestos, or asbestos, uh, mm. we'll find that. Yeah, so things like that, uh, even the you know the lead piping and things like that, you I wouldn't even know. Again, uh, it's five six hundred bucks. It's yeah. when you're buying a or property, less. but even though even less, if yeah. it's five, even if it's a thousand dollars, you're buying a twenty thirty sixty hundred a million dollar property. It's 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 a very little cost. To make sure that what you're buying is is sound. It's like insurance in the end. Yeah, it is. It's a form and, of insurance. And it's also, you know, we use it for negotiation powers too. I agree. There's Absolutely. no inspection period. It's like going to an orthodontist. If if you go to an orthodontist, everyone's teeth are crooked to some degree, or or you have an overbite or whatever. No, it, yeah, it's really you're right. So no inspection that I know of, unless you see one, no inspection comes out squeaky clean saying everything's great. No, 
The inspector looks for shit, and they'll find shit on anything. There's always shit. And on they'll things. give you a timeline of urgency for each of these items. And I'm saying there's strategies that we use when we get the inspection. So not only is it insurance, so you know what's wrong with it, but you'll get that back and say, you know what, that's a, a, another tool now that, or another strategy to go back to the seller and say, hey man, this wasn't disclosed. Right. Either you got to get these fixed, or we're going to reduce the price. Now, just um, <clears throat> it's the. Uh, there's kind of a stigma around retrading, which is, you know, we agree on a price and then we go back and try to renegotiate the price based on the inspection. So I know that uh, many poo-poo the idea of retrading. So to combat that, because I don't want to be that guy that tries to renegotiate every deal that, you know, gets done. That's, that's terrible and it doesn't build good reputation. What I'll ask is, what's wrong with the property that we can expect? So when we send the inspector, we're going to know these things are wrong and they're going to disclose whatever they they want to tell us uh, and i can't tell you how many times that you know th th there's a huge leak in the roof and they've never just the roof is the roof okay yeah it's absolutely fa fine and then you get there and the inspector's like dude there's a huge leak on the roof it's like yeah but it only leaks for four months of the year after yeah. that it's fine. and only when it rains <laughs> and, and only when it's it you know it's like come on all right you know, it happens. Happens. so <laughs> and, and at that point it's like you told us the roof was fine and, you know, here's yeah. the email that shows that it's not. So, you know, if you're not going to tell us the truth, then we're going to have to do something about that. Again, so, that's it. But I, again, that's... Uh, we just want what's fair. We, but, but we account... We, we, oh, listen, I'm not saying we, we, I renegotiate every deal that comes back with an inspection because we account for repairs. The minimum we do, even if the seller says there's no repairs, five. we still deduct 5000 yeah, off the bat. Right off the bat. If he says there's nothing. Now, if there is something, we, we, we add to that because it's usually not... What they say, if they say, oh, it only needs about eight thousand, you know, be prepared to pay mm -hmm. about fifteen, and we account for that automatically. Yep. But when mm -hmm. you get the report back, and it's twenty five, well, that's when you have to go back and right. renegotiate, unless um, the numbers support it, yeah. uh, or you know, you got such a great deal that even if it was twenty five instead of eight, it still makes a lot of you sense. You could swallow it, yeah. yeah. Where you know, it, where in this circumstance, uh, if the person doesn't get exactly that amount, they're going to die. Uh, they can't do their operation. So we have to use common sense and compassion uh, whenever we're buying, you know, what are the seller's actual needs? Are we doing something that's fair? Or are we, um, you know, are we really splitting hairs uh, over, over principle? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and our ego gets in the way. It's not about that. It's yeah. how much risk are we taking? Can we swallow that risk? And if it's not swallowable, even if they absolutely need the money, but we're putting ourselves in a position of huge risk to help them, yeah. that's terrible. Well, we don't want to do that either. As much as I'd love to help you, the numbers don't support us being able to help you. I'd love to buy it, but with this new $50,000 furnace that needs to be put in, the numbers don't work anymore. No, so we right. can't make it work. Okay, so we got the house. We verified so we the cost, the value. We verified the expenses the by flows. looking at the insurance, the, the property taxes, and all those other jazz. The inspection, jazz. the report is in. Once the numbers check out or whatever, there's and, one and one the comps check out, no, yeah, I got the inspector. Yeah, and then what do we that. do after that? Then you got to look for some of the managed property. Yep. So you need to uh, start looking for property managers. Uh, we typically like to send three uh, property management, uh, either companies or individuals. Uh, we prefer companies uh, that, that, that are professionals at this. You send three of them to the property and they're going to do two things. One, they're going to check if uh, this is something that they're willing to manage for you and take care of the property since you're not going to be anywhere near it. And two, uh, there are another set of eyes that are going to tell you what the property looks like, what the neighborhood looks like, and if they already manage properties in that area, uh, what else that can they can they do is they can uh, actually tell you uh, what the rental uh, value is in that area because presumably they have other other properties that they manage in the same neighborhood. So you can tell whether your rental meter check uh, actually checks out if you were too conservative, too aggressive. So they're going to validate that number for you. And why do we need three? We need three not only to go check it, we need three to say, yes, I'm willing to manage this. And the reason we do that is because even though you decide to hire one of the three, because you're only going to hire one property management company, well, what if they don't pan out? What if they suck? What if they quit? Uh, you need someone else to go in there and manage. And, you know, we've, we've had stories where, you know, we, we, we've had a property manager in place and then for one reason or another, they ended up you know, we had to fire them or they were stealing and then we had to get rid of them. They hook up with tenants, whatever. Yeah, they hook yeah. up with tenants, that's right. And and then and then you're stuck because there's no one else that's willing to manage it. There's no other property managers in the area that are willing to take your property. So what now? The 
basically true. the tenants are running the show. Yeah, the monkeys run the zoo <laughs> at that point. That's right. And three different management companies, to period. Agree. They agree have to be willing to. and able yeah. to manage the property. And, and if, there's, if there's only two in town, uh, you're going to get screwed because one person's going to do it and then they know that there's only one game in town, you're going to get rid of them and then they're going to basically do nothing and just collect rent. And if you, there's only two options, which means Second, hold you you're balls. never, ever going to collect, get any money. Well, I, there's I, a third option. Yeah. You, got, you got to move there. Yeah. <laughs> which, not enough. which you not don't want to do. Yeah, so, which you don't want to do. Yeah. So what do you do if there's, uh, there's only two management companies in town? We don't buy it. Uh, for, 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 for me, well, we don't We, we, we don't wholesale buy it. it to a local. Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> yeah. We and don't buy it, we wholesale it to a local. We wholesale it to a local or, you know, we don't buy it. It's yeah. that simple and it's not worth the risk because the management, uh, based on, on our experience, is the most critical part of, of, of this equation because even if the condition is bad, you can spend money and fix something, yep. but the property management is, is just, it's irreplaceable. Well, you there's two things to... that will fuck you in the business, yeah. right? Um, actually, three. Uh, one is not buying it right. Uh, and mm -hmm. two is bad management. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you have bad managers, uh, you never collect money, you can't pay your bills, uh, bad things happen, and you need to make sure your management is really solid. So it's important to go through uh, the right checks and balances on your management. We'll have a, an episode just on, I think, finding the right management team. Yes. Um, I think that would be very helpful for, for those listening. But, yeah. What um, questions to ask them, et cetera. Yeah. But, and yeah. what software they're using so we can, you know, dig in and see what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, making sure they're not nickeling and diming us on, uh, on, on you know, on, um, on maintenance calls because, you know, that's a big way of getting screwed over. So many little things can add up to big things. It's the, sm the devil is really in the details at that point. But from a general um, um, due diligence perspective, I think we've covered uh, pretty much so yeah, everything. Let's quickly recap. Yes. Start with value. Yep. Value checks out, you get to the income and expenses, that checks out, send the inspector, get a report. Once you're satisfied with that, whether you renegotiate it or not, we'll move on to finding three property managers that are willing and able to manage the property. You find you find three that are willing and able, you pick one, and then you're ready to close. Yeah, I think Super. that sums it up very nicely. Good. Very good. High five. Use those things and start making some money. If you like this episode of Big Fat Real Estate Checks, then show some love by leaving a comment and a good rating. Also, as a thank you for tuning in today, we've got a special free gift. The journey to passive cash flow for a life starts by finding deals, and it's easier than you think. Simply go to getdealsbytuesday.com, enter your email address, and we'll send you a free quick start course called Deals by Tuesday. Even if it's 11 p.m. Monday night, this course will show you how to find discounted real estate deals by Tuesday. It's that fast and simple. Go to GetDealsByTuesday.com and start your journey toward life-changing cash flow today. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode.